Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you to the organizers uh, for the inv invitation and opportunity to speak. Um, thank you to all of you for coming to IPAM, um, sticking around until the very last talk on you know, Friday afternoon. Um, and to those of you who are not uh, LA locals, apologies. You've hit such an unlucky, rainy uh, Los Angeles day. Um, not, not very common. Um, so I'm a, a new assistant professor at Harvey Mudd College in the Department of Mathematics. Um, if you're not familiar with Harvey Mudd College, we're very small. We're about 42 miles east of here. It's a small, selective liberal arts college. So, Okay, and I'm going to talk about um, some work that kind of spans several, mostly pandemic years, um, uh, which was work that began while I was a postdoc here at UCLA in the Mathematics Department. Um, and it really started out of um, some work that was done by a group of undergraduates um, in a, the UCLA Summer REU um, program. Um, and then it's going to continue on. I, I'll talk about a couple. I'll really focus on these second two works, um, which again were done at UCLA while I was a postdoc working with um, Deanna Needell, who's a professor in the mathematics department. And it was joint with um, who was at that time just an exceptional undergraduate student here and who has now moved on to bigger and better things. He's a, a PhD student in computer science at MIT, uh, Josh Vendro. Okay, so um, without further ado, I'm gonna dive into um, some motivation. And the motivation that I'm gonna start with is maybe not exactly the motivation that we um, have been seeing here, but maybe you can use your imagination and, and find connections. Um, and it's really motivation for looking at tensor decompositions um, in general, and I'll kind of get to and, and point out why I'm particularly interested in these hierarchical um, tensor decompositions. Okay, so um, we're working with high dimensional data all of the time. And one of the tasks that we have many, many names for and, and need to do all the time um, is just learning uh, efficient ways of finding the trends that are in that high dimensional data. So, um, you know, maybe this group would scoff at me calling this high dimensional data. Um, but <laughs> let's imagine we have documents. These documents have many, many words. Um, if you are a physician who has taken down, you know, who has, has um, collected these patient surveys and now has the task of reading through them and understanding what are the trends that your patients are maybe um, experiencing, this is high dimensional data, right? That's work that you don't want to do and we want to make efficient for you. And so we could take this data just to make it really explicit so that we all recognize it as data, um, right? We could form a term document matrix, go to the bag of words model for this data. Right, and we're right in our realm of a bunch of vectors that we would want to understand their similarity. Okay, um, So maybe one motivation, I, you'll see I kind of have this um, medical flavor of motivation, um, is to understand symptom trends and shared patient experiences in an automated way that doesn't you know, require our expensive physicians to read through all of their many, many documents. Okay, um, another uh, motivation. So these are images of what's called an echocardiogram. Um, echocardiograms are ultrasound medical imaging techniques. I work with a group of cardiologists who I'm sure are just uh, shaking their heads at my description of this, but um, patients in, in getting these echocardiograms done um, lay down on a bed and uh, a doctor or a trained echocardiogram technician um, uses an ultrasound wand and is imaging um, actually a video, a, a video of their um, whatever, um, whatever function is happening in their body. But in this um, set of frames from a video, this is um, images of their heart beating. You can really see all four chambers in the, in the heart here. Okay. Um, so the previous example was maybe a motivation for why we're interested in trends from matrix data. And this is going to give us um, some motivation for why we might be interested in trends from higher order data like tensors. So um, when uh, physicians do this type of imaging study, right, they're collecting um, pixel information over many frames of the video. And even more interestingly is there's this third mode that I've um, labeled stress, and I truly mean stress here. Um, it sounds very unpleasant, but the um, patients 
are ma made to undergo different levels of physiological stress in a multitude of ways. Um, one of the traditional ways is that they put that patient up on a treadmill, and I'm imagining a you know, nurse in the background is like, run, run, run. Um, <laughs> and as their stress level you know, naturally increases, um, they just keep laying them down and taking these um, images uh, over and over in these videos. Okay? Or the nicer version is that they give them um, pharmacological um, you know, medication that makes their stress levels go up. That sounds much nicer than, than running on a treadmill. Okay, so uh, another motivation right in line with um, the previous one we saw is trying to learn the cohesive parts and separate out noise in an automated way um, in medical imaging studies. So these are a couple of the reasons, a couple of the places where we get interested in uh, matrix factorization and tensor decomposition models, but why hierarchical? Okay, so one of the, the main things is that it's often really nice within data sets to know not just what are the kind of trends, the parts, the topics that are present inside of your data, but how are they related, which ones are more or less related to one another. Okay? So this is where the hierarchy comes in. We don't want to just learn parts or topics. We really want to understand how um, the kind of hierarchical structure of how they're related. And then secondly, um, one of the main questions, I almost always get this question somewhere in a talk, is how do you choose the number of topics or parts to learn? That's incredibly challenging. Hierarchical models are maybe one approach that helps you step away um, from that hyperparameter decision. Okay. okay, so this is motivating us to talk about specifically hierarchical matrix factorization and tensor decomposition topic or parts-based models. Okay, and now I'm going to jump in. I'll talk a little bit about the foundational models upon which the work that I'm going to describe is built. Okay, so the first one is non-negative matrix factorization. So maybe just a show of hands who's read about, thought about, taught, done work with, right? Okay, lots and lots of people. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, the non-negative matrix factorization model says given non-negative, or sometimes not non-negative, but given some data matrix X, we're going to factorize it into two lower rank um, non-negative matrices A and S. Right? So this choice of R um, constrains the rank of each of these two matrices, and so we're getting some low rank approximation to our original data matrix. L again, there's lots of reasons to think about these models, um, some more applied than others, but in particular, um, this is a nice go-to model if you're interested in doing um, dimensionality reduction or potentially topic modeling, learning those trends or topics inside of your data. Okay? Um, I always like to say, too, if you're interested, like if your data um, has, let's say, the natural data elements, um, maybe those are surveys or something, are represented as columns of your data matrix, um, then depending on which of these two matrices you're more interested in, I can usually tell whether you're more interested in one of these two topics. If you're really interested in the dimensionality reduction, right, here's your data, these are your data points, right, corresponding columns in S for, uh, form your low dimensional representation. If you're more interested in A, you're really probably more interested in what are the, like, you know, are many high level topics in your data. Okay. Okay, so we formulate this as an optimization problem, and there's tons of optimizers um, here and in the room. Um, these are non-convex optimization problems, but these days no one's scared of those words. We just say use some um, special variant of stochastic gradient descent or other mo uh, methods that are um, specifically uh, good for these non-negative constrained models. Um, get into some local minima and we're, we're happy. Okay. Okay, so um, again, this is a slide that um, this room doesn't need, but I like to show it because it really helps me move on to tensors. Um, so if we think about our factorization, right, we can represent the factorization, this product of two matrices, using the sum of rank one component matrices, right? As soon as I show this, I feel like people. If you want to imagine a tensor, right, a higher order um, variant of a matrix, I mean, you immediately see what the generalization is to tensor decompositions. We just end up with this additional factor matrix. matrix. So there's now a factor matrix for every mode, 
that's true in NMF, but it's definitely true for tensor decompositions. And the meaning of this kind of strange collection of matrices is really that this represents the sum of the rank one outer products of these co um, columns of the factor matrices. Okay? Okay, so we're going to build upon these two models to get ourselves to some hierarchical models. Um, the easiest space to start, oh, sorry, and I should say, I'm going to use this notation, this kind of double brackets of x1 through xk to represent the um, sum of these rank one outer products. So this is represented with these little double brackets of all of these factor matrices. Okay, are there questions at this point? No? Okay. Okay, so the first space that we'll move on to hierarchical models is in um, matrix-based models. It's really simple to see there, and then we'll try to move up to tensor models from that point. So hierarchical NMF is a model that's been around. I, I cite this paper of Kachaki and Zudnik um, in 2006, but really it's kind of been in the ether ever since uh, NMF was popularized. Um, and the idea is just that you're going to sequentially factorize to learn a hierarchical, um, a hierarchical construction of topics. So we start with, ooh, sorry, this takes a second to go into focus. So we start with our uh, data matrix X. We factorize it in the first layer into the product of these two matrices. And now we're just going to step, um, go one step further. So by the way, these, the constrained model rank for these, this factorization is K0. And now I'm going to imagine I want to learn some smaller number of um, kind of metatopics or supertopics, K1. And so I'm going to then factorize the second factor matrix S0 into the product of two matrices, right? thereby constraining um, uh, the model rank now to K1. Okay. OK, and you can just keep doing this for as many layers as you'd like. Um, every, as you move uh, one step deeper in the layers, you're learning, if you're learning KL topics at that layer, you're collecting the KL minus one subtopics at the L minus first layer into KL super like metatopics, right? You're combining them into fewer topics. Okay, so um, one of the really nice things about this model, and one thing that we'll really want to try to preserve as we move up into tensor decompositions, is that no matter which of these uh, model ranks I'm considering, right? K0, K1, you know, KL minus one, whatever it is, um, I can understand the relationship between whatever each of these modes of my matrix represent and the topic, that number of topics, using just some subset of products of these factor matrices, right? So if I want to know the relationship between whatever, you know, these M features of my data um, with the K minus one topics, I just take the product of these two matrices, A0 times A1, and that's really giving me a linear relationship between each of the M features and the K minus 1 topics, the really super topics at that layer. Okay? And the same thing is true if I want to know the relationship between um, N right, and my K0, I can take the product of these two uh, matrices, and so I have a relationship between whatever N represents and my K0 super topics or K0 topics. Okay. okay, so that's something that we like about this model. It's really useful. Um, it makes it really easy for us to interrogate um, what these, these topics that are learned um, and how they relate to the raw data that we have. Okay, so um, the picture goes like this, right? As we factorize, we learn from whatever our raw data represents. Maybe it's something like symptoms. Um, we collect into some topics after one factorization, and we can just keep building up. After an additional factorization, we've collected even those topics into super topics, um, and this process continues. Okay, so um, you know, in response to the two questions I posed um, in our motivational section, um, this model is nice, right, for matrix data. It's elucidating the hierarchical relationship of the learned topics at these different levels of, of layers, right? We're seeing how topics collect into supertopics. 
In addition, if you are one of those people who can't figure out how to choose your model rank, you don't really need to do so. If you're like, I want to try 7, 17, and 107, well, learn a layered model with model ranks 107, 17, and 7. Right? It gives you um, the flexibility to try a bunch of different model ranks all at once and to understand how the information you're getting at each of those layers um, is uh, interrelated. What question? Yeah. Uh, could, could you point out the um, connection to hierarchical clustering? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're, so this is just like by itself a hierarchical clustering method. Um, so particularly if, let's say, your, your data elements that you're trying to cluster is represented by these, the n dimension. Um, if you interrogate this S0 matrix, and let's say you could even introduce some constraints that say I want to associate each of my um, n data elements to K0 clusters. Right? If you had like a one hot encoded matrix here, you'd be reading off which cluster assignment they've been made. And then if you have additionally it, you know, you have to get kind of clever to make this um, product of matrices look like a clustering relationship. Um, but you can again, right, you'll be reading off uh, the K1, um, the, oh sorry, it's not the product, it's just this matrix. We'll be reading off the um, clustering assignment of N to K1. And you're actually getting this additional information from this product of matrices that tells you sort of why you hire large group. Yep. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so that's sort of what this is trying to represent. If, if instead of symptoms this said data points, this is just interrogating um, these n data points and how they collect into different levels of, of hierarchical clustering. Yeah. You also ask a stupid question. If you start initially with the big matrix, but you do it in a very stupid way, so there are some symptoms there and then further down, they're not grouped, how does that then end up? Is that impossible to, to do it in a meaningful way? So if he, I don't think I understood your question. Is it if um, they separate out, if they're related in some... Well, this sort of suggests that this is similar things are grouped in, in subcategories. Um, and the similar information should then be in, in, in similar, end up in the same similar matrices. Yeah. But if your initial data set was done in a very stupid way, could it be a problem or not? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you're... Um, if I understood your question correctly, your question was saying, like, what if I have some symptoms that really are supposed to be related, but in this data... Yeah, they, they turn up here and there and everywhere. Yes, absolutely. So we are, we are restricted to how the data co-occurs. Um, if, if there's really no uh, kind of connection in either of these two modes between two trends or whatever we, whatever, at whatever level we're thinking here, if there are, um, if there's no linear relationship present in this matrix, we won't find it. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. But I think the question was different. I think the question was simply about sorting in, yeah. in the X matrix. And I think you don't need to assume that things are sorted already because the factorization will figure it out, right? Oh, is that, the, is that right? So if you're, you're saying like, what if my, if I have two very similar, Oh yes, it's permutation invariant. Yes, yep. permutation invariant. So the order of either the features nor the um, the uh, data points makes any difference um, in the the execution of optimization algorithms for this technique. That's not always like you're kind of it's a non-convex optimization problem, and so like all sorts of little data uh, perturbations can make weird effects, but. It should be, ideally, the problems are permutation invariant. OK, great. OK, so in the um, first portion of, of the um, new material in the talk, I'm going to give you two ways of trying to move from hierarchical non-negative matrix factorization to a hierarchical tensor decomposition. One of them is better than the other. Um, I'll start there. So how do we generalize this? So first, let me just say, again, this is like one of those slides where you could just take a picture. Um, but uh, this is, uh, I'm just trying to give you an idea. There's a lot of work. Um, there's a lot of people for reasons of being related to hierarchical clustering or hierarchical variants of mixture models, et cetera. There's a lot of people who've been really interested in 
um, generating hierarchical matrix factorization and tensor decomposition models. So here's just a few really popular examples. Um, for a variety of reasons, these are not really relevant to our non-negative tensor decomposition case. Perhaps the most related um, work that I have seen um, is uh, this work of Kachaki, Zudnek, and Amari, um, where they're proposing some um, really methods for non-negative matrix um, factorization. Um, but along the way, they actually build this tensor decomposition that they can glean hierarchy from. Um, it's a little interesting. It's, it's kind of a, a surprising fact that the results that they get, the, the model that they propose, depends upon a, a hyperparameter choice you make. Um, and specifically, they're focused on 3D tensors. And the hyperparameter choice you have to make is which mode you're going to try to learn your hierarchy from. The hierarchy is not equally treated by every mode of the tensor. It's actually focused and, and learned from just a single mode. So if you um, don't want to make that choice, this model is a little bit trickier to use. You have to kind of pull together a bunch of different factorizations. OK, and then um, I'm going to propose, or sorry, I'm going to present a couple of pieces of work um, that I've done with, uh, again, Josh Vendro and Deanna Nidell. Um, this was our first work. I'm very proud of it, but um, like I said, there's sort of a couple of, there's an issue and then a positive um, out of this work. So the issue is that um, uh, what I'd like to learn is a single hierarchical relationship for my entire tensor that's respected by all of the modes of the factorization. Um, this model does not give it to you. It is a naive model, which I'll present. Um, but one of the things I'll highlight is that we're, we were able to generalize um, a really good training method, what I think is a good idea, um, for how to train these models um, for that, that model. Um, and then we proposed what I think is a better model. It gives you a single hierarchical, hierarchical relationship, um, but we only have this naive training method for it. And so somewhere um, in the future, there is a combination of these two model and method that I think uh, should be much nicer. OK, so let's jump into, we'll focus on these two papers. I'll start with what I'm going to call the kind of take one model. So take one, hierarchical NCPD. And the unfortunate thing is that we named it hierarchical NCPD. So then we were stuck. That's the name I'd like to give to the best model. But we already named this model hierarchical NCPD. So lesson learned. Don't waste your good names until you're certain. <laughs> OK, so here's our, our tensor. And so our hierarchical model starts out. We just learn a rank R NCPD model. No hierarchy, just you know, initial factorizations using a first choice uh, rank R. Okay, And then? just apply a hierarchical NMF model independently to each factor matrix. Okay, so this definitely gets you to, um, you know, you're, you're getting some information um, about these later ranks, R0, and their relationship to each of the tensor modes, each of these, you know, N1, N2, N3. Um, but the unfortunate thing um, is that these aren't going to be, these aren't going to preserve the relationship across all of the um, all of the modes. So um, the positive, we can extend a really good training method for hierarchical NMF, which we call neural NMF. Um, I'll present this, this model or this training method later called, called neural NCPD. Um, but the sad face news is that we get a different hierarchy across tensor modes. There's nothing constraining the, these later learned factor matrices A0 uh, S0 for, a, for the first, second, or third modes, there's nothing constraining them to have similar hierarchical relationship. The linear relationship learned at each mode is independent of one another, and thus um, it's not overall a single hierarchy for the, the entire tensor. Yeah? So in this case, though, you do have to choose the rank in advance? Yes. So you are inputting always some R, R0, are you know K or um, uh, you're always inputting some choice of ranks. My point from earlier was that if you were 
actually interested in just a single set of topics, but you weren't sure the rank, let's say you're like choosing between one and seven, just input the ranks one through seven and then learn this type of model. Okay, so you still have some choice that you're inputting. You still have to make a choice, but um, you get a little broader, broader options. Yeah. So in your case, if you chose rank one through seven, but seven was too large, is there any way to see that? Like, okay, I didn't need those higher ranks and I could have stuck with the lower ones? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, so there's not a whole lot beyond what you could already kind of glean from like an elbow method. You can still do an elbow method type type thing in this um, thing and say, say like, okay, by you know going from seven to six, I actually didn't didn't lose any um, uh, factorization fit. Yeah, that's a good question. Other questions? You choose all the R's, right, as input. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is take two. This is what I think is a better model. Um, but we don't have a great method. So um, same start. So we've got our, our data tensor. Um, we learn our first rank um, NCPD, right? So uh, a tensor factorization. And then we're going to move on to a lower rank NCPD model. But in particular, we're going to constrain each of the factor matrices um, for the same mode between the two um, between the two layers to be linearly related, right? So the uh, associated to the jth mode at the elf layer, um, that factor matrix should be linearly related to the jth mode factor matrix in the L plus first layer using this common kind of topic collector matrix WL. Okay, so WL notice doesn't depend upon um, the mode, it's shared between all of the modes. So we're sort of saying, okay, we have to go to a lower rank systematically um, all through, through all of the modes, what's the best collection of um, these uh, R L minus one topics into R L topics that we can achieve. Okay. Okay, and um, so just to make this really clear, um, the uh, factor matrices at the second layer of the um, hierarchical tensor decomposition are these collected, these W0 times the previous X matrices. Okay. Okay, and you can, again, just keep doing that for as long as you'd like to for as many model ranks as you have chosen to try. And this gives us the, the kind of really good news is that this gives us a single hierarchical relationship for all modes. So in particular, um, this is similar to the hierarchical NMF model in that whichever mode you want to, you want to look into, if you're like, I really like this third mode, you want to know how it's related to, you know, the R elf set of topics, um, you just look through all of the W matrices. And that's true across all of the modes. So you, you get the same, the same relationship. Okay, and so like I said, um, we just have a really naive training process. I'll run through that just to show you that it's naive and then maybe to give you some motivation for how we would try to improve it. Um, so this, um, the model multi-aged NTF we can train. So we use our favorite NCPD model solver um, to learn the initial factor matrices. And then in uh, each layer afterwards, we're learning a single matrix, right? We're taking this one um, collector matrix W and we're just um, minimizing um, the appearance of that matrix in this um, tensor decomposition error. Um, that turns out to just be a, a, a non-negatively constrained polynomial optimization problem. And then um, you collect your data matri matrix in the way that you've just learned, um, and you restart again and learn the next W matrix. And so you're just learning the W matrix in each layer. In practice, what we actually do is we just do, um, in this case, we do independent NCPD um, learns and then take the W matrices that are produced in each, or sorry, we, we do um, independent NMF um, uh, steps for each of these different mode um, factorizations. And then we take the W matrix that's learned in each of those independent NMFs 
and average them. And then we like repeat over and over and over again. Okay, so you can approximate this, um, this model using um, an NMF method just on each mode with an extra averaging step. Um, but what I'll highlight is that really um, we could and probably should be trying to do um, something that will help us uh, keep these W matrices um, learned together. We'll actually constrain all of the modes together and get closer to this optimization problem. And then additionally, using uh, the neural network structure that I'll describe um, later um, can be really helpful. It gives us some better training methods. Okay, so with that, I'm just gonna take a brief moment to jump into some experiments and to kind of give you an advertisement for the last um, section of the talk. Okay, so I'm gonna, it's just a bunch of experiments, so apologies, you're gonna get like a bunch of tables for a moment, but hopefully it's, uh, hopefully it gets you interested in backpropagation. Okay, so we have this synthetic tensor, so this is actually like a visualization of how we built the tensor. We took a, a, a three-order tensor, and we um, put into it these constant blocks um, along one of the diagonals of um, differing intensity. Um, so there's two blocks um, of this kind of gray set that has some small intensity. I think it's like maybe value one. And then within those blocks, there's these four blocks um, that are blue and have a slightly higher intensity, like maybe two. And then um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six additional blocks, um, which are this orange color and it's the highest intensity. So really this tensor should be decomposable exactly using a rank seven decomposition. Seven is just coming from, there's six um, of these orange blocks that can't be handled um, together and then this additional blue box that's separate. Yes. Uh, so basically the different colors are different constants. Yes. And uh, the empty color, the background color is zero. Zero, yep. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a much more succinct way of describing this tensor. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so, um, so we'll see now what I'm going to present to you is uh, relative reconstruction errors on this tensor for models learned, hierarchical models learned with a seven, four, two topic structure, right? And so really they should just pick up the seven they should pick up is blue, orange, 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 and then the four blue and then the two biggest white. Okay. okay, so um, these reconstruction errors don't look great, but let me just tell you that this is the name of the game in this area. You're never, there's, there's noise in this um, tensor that we built, and so you're never getting perfect reconstruction error, and you're always um, really suffering uh, due to the non-negative constraints and the, um, the noise. Okay, so um, what I'm showing you is, um, are the models that I've just show, uh, described to you, multi-HNTF. This is the model that respects the, um, the hierarchical structure across all of the modes. There's um, the more naive model I presented before, and then there's this model I described above that had the, or that I described before of Kachaki et al. that has the hyperparameter choice that you have to make, the mode choice, okay? Um, and what you can see is that uh, there's like some various different behavior, but in particular of these ones that I want you to focus on, um, we're getting pretty good results from the multi-HNTF model. So in some sense, what I'm, what I'm trying to point out is that I think this uh, natural decision of having all of the, the modes respect the same hierarchy in a tensor where all of the modes should and can respect the same hierarchy um, is gonna give us the, the best reconstruction error. Okay, and maybe as an advertisement of what's to come, what I'm going to describe in the next section is gonna tell you about this um, neural training method for the previous standard HNCPD model. Um, and these are, of course, the, the bolded values. These are the best. Um, they're incomparable because they're using a much better training method than the, um, these other models. Quickly? Yeah. Could you maybe uh, say a few words about how these errors are to be interpreted? Because like, you have the same number for r equals 7 in all the methods, and then they don't differ very much for the others. So I, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, um, okay, so maybe let's start with why are they all the same for the R0 equals 7? They're all the same because the very first layer of each of these models just asks us to learn an NCPD model of rank 7. And so it would be very dishonest of me to not start these models all from the same rank 7 NCPD model. Okay, um, in the next layers, um, the model structures differ between all, actually, um, five of these models. And so what you're, the difference you're seeing is the fact that then going on to learn four topics from these seven in, with different constraints um, and how the seven get collected into four um, are really coming from uh, those model choices. Okay, so the difference here, they're all using now the same training method. They're just different structured models. And so any differences we're seeing in the um, training error, the training, or sorry, the uh, reconstruction error here, um, I'm claiming is due to the structure. And perfect performance would mean what number there? Uh, zero. Lower, lower values are better. Yeah. 1.55 okay. is oh. much different from 0.56 in HMTF3, for example. <laughs> Uh, maybe. <laughs> so um, maybe to give you a little bit of evidence for, for reasons why not to just be like, okay, whatever here, is um, these are averaged over many, many trials. Um, that there is truly a hierarchical signal that's present here. And that the way that we built it is um, we really, we've embedded into the different um, uh, modes different pieces of the hierarchy. Like they can learn different parts of this hierarchical structure. So any, you know, not being able to learn different parts of this hierarchical structure um, could be because they don't have access to the, hier the modes. So I'm not going to touch too, too much being able to tell you whether this, these two numbers are different enough, but, uh, but I want it to be so, so. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so um, let's jump into just a couple of real data examples. Um, you know, in the United States, we just had an election. If you're not election talked out, let's circle back to 2016. Um, and we have a Twitter data set that came from a bunch of tweets um, coming from these uh, political candidates during that 2016 presidential election season. So we have um, tweets from eight politicians, really the kind of four most recognizable um, Republican candidates, and then the four most recognizable Democratic um, uh, Democrat uh, candidates from that election cycle. Okay. Um, so what I'm just going to really quickly show you is uh, the topics that were learned by our uh, multi-HNTF model um, at rank eight rank four and rank two. So these are really um, constrained in the way that I just showed you. We've got um, uh, topics that are uh, corresponding to um, each of the different modes. And so in the modes, we have the eight candidates, the months that they were tweeting, and then the words that they tweeted most in that month, or really an aggregation of the words they tweeted in that month. And so what you can see is that when we allow the model to have eight topics, it's learning almost a topic per, um, uh, per candidate, which is unsurprising, actually, if you interrogate their tweets. Um, they tweet their own names quite a lot. So, <laughs> um, And then if you, um, if you collect into four topics, um, what you learn are there's still kind of these topics that are dedicated mostly to the Republican candidates. Um, and then the four uh, Democratic candidates kind of get lumped together. You can read into that what you wish, whether it means that they're tweeting about material things or their, their tweets are falling back into the background. Who knows? Who knows? But um, And then uh, in the second, in the, the rank two layer, um, we get kind of more of this collection. We've got... Um, the, Rep sorry, the uh, Democratic candidates, uh, Trump, and then Cruz and Kasich um, are together. And so, um, again, I don't know if you uh, recall that election, um, but 
uh, Trump and uh, Hillary Clinton were tweeting back and forth quite often, and especially they were tweeting back and forth quite often in the last months leading up to the election. And so you're really able to, to see that collect that way. Question? Yeah. Um, does it matter how many examples you put in per candidate? You know, but, uh, if, if one of them basically sends many more messages, usually there's a total weight on this one. Yeah, yeah. 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 So we, we do some normalization techniques that are common, um, like TF-IDF um, techniques and some other normalization techniques to try to take care of exactly that, because there are some candidates that tweeted many, 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 many more times. <laughs> Um. <laughs> okay, so um, again, we're seeing just kind of similar uh, results here um, in terms of the reconstruction error. Notice the reconstruction error here, it's really tough because um, trying to fit to uh, a whole slew, a whole you know, vocabulary of words that, that people are using is, is really tricky. And so you can really only learn a small percentage of the overall energy. Um, in this tensor. Um, but we're seeing kind of similar results where multi-HNTF, at least in some of the layers, has some really good structure and is able to outperform um, some of its competitors. And so again, we're using this as evidence that we think this multi-HNTF structure is kind of a better structure than um, some of the others. Okay, any last questions? So in the interest of time, I'm actually gonna skip over the last just toy experiment. Um, and jump into the back propagation section. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how we can uh, train these models um, better in a less naive manner. Okay, so um, in either of these two models that I've just showed you, hierarchical NCBD or multi-HNTF, um, one thing to keep in mind is that if you do the process the way that I've described, you learn your factorization or your decomposition um, layer by layer, taking as fixed the prior layer's information, you will run into devastating error propagation through the layers. So really what's happening is like you're getting some suboptimal local minima in the um, previous layers and then you're taking that, that factor, or sorry, that um, information and you're factorizing it further. Um, in particular, even local minima that are nice might not admit later good factorizations. There might be a worse, you know, a worse factor matrix for these prior layers that are more factorizable, like downstream. Okay. And so what we hope to do is to figure out some way of back propagating that good or bad factorization information from the later layers back up into the prior layers to kind of nudge us into better initial factor matrices that are better factorizable later. Okay, so, okay, just a quick reminder again, um, I like to show pictures uh, to show you how I'm thinking about these things. So I'm gonna remind you about neural networks, remind you all about neural networks, there's like inventors here, so. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got these neural networks. The way that we think about neural networks is that there's these um, uh, weight matrices are these independent variables that um, determine how the dependent variables flow through and iterate through the network. Um, the goal, right, is to nudge your independent variables, these weight matrices, to something that serves the map that you're looking for, that's gonna take your non, learn the nonlinear map that takes your pictures of cats and dogs to correct labels of cats and dogs, right? Okay, so uh, let's collapse that picture down. Um, we don't really care. There's some nonlinear function. We're trying to learn nonlinear functions or nonlinear maps that take us from x's to their nearly corresponding y's. And we do that in two steps. There's the forward propagation step where we actually just say whatever our, our fixed estimation of this um, forward function is, we shove all of the data through. And then we, along that way, use the information we calculated to compute the gradients and we back propagate to update these weight matrices, the independent variables. Okay. Okay, so now let's move this to NMF. Right? So the very first thing we have to do is like, where is the architecture here? Where are the choices of independent and dependent variables? How are we going to 
make the analogy between NMF or hierarchical NMF and this neural network. Um, and the choice is where we have two sets of variables that we see in every layer. There's the A matrices and the S matrices, right? So A and then the S matrices. So we're going to record the A matrices as the independent variables as our weights. And we're going to, in, in imagining the forward flow, we're going to say that those are fixed. And then they are going to determine our S matrices. That's the forward propagation step. Okay, and the way that they are going to determine the S matrices is um, we're going to define this non-negative constrained least squares function. So Q takes in X, some matrix X, and some weight or independent variable A, and it's going to output the solution to this non-negative least squares problem, S. Okay, so if you had a fixed A, if you knew what the A matrices were, this would be a really good way to learn the best factorization, um, uh, the best NMF factorization, um, because right, you're just solving a non-negative least squares problem. So we pin the values of S to those of A recursively by just setting um, S at the ELF layer to be the non-negative least squares um, solution um, using um, a sub L, which we imagine to be fixed, and the output from the previous layer, S sub L minus 1. So in particular, after the first factorization, this is um, S sub L minus 1. It goes in. We imagine A1 is fixed, and we learn S1 from it. So it's just doing this little, yeah. So it's almost yes. like alternating the squares, but you choose layer of leadership. Absolutely, yeah. So there's a really strong connection to one of the most popular training methods for non-negative matrix factorization, alternating least squares. It's just that we're going to do this process of we learn, we alternate all on the sequence of S matrices, and then we use, instead of a least squares technique, we back propagate. Okay, okay so um, to put the picture, to make the analogy complete, right? we start out with X, we get to our first um, dependent variable S0 using the independent variables at the first layer and this function Q, so forward propagation. Okay, so the training process, right, is forward propagation, just solve uh, a sequence of convex optimization problems, and then just back propagate, right? Okay, so um, what I'll say is that none of this is extremely hard, but the back propagation step is, is like the only tricky thing. You have to figure out how to um, calculate these gradients, and then hopefully you have a student who likes PyTorch, and they PyTorch for you. <laughs> um, okay, and how do we get from this hierarchical non-negative matrix factorization technique to a tensor technique? Well, if we are working with the HNCPD model, we just have these independent hierarchical NMF models, and we can apply this approach to each mode. Right? So if this is our visualization of HNCPD, you now just have one of these um, nets right, for each of the modes, learning each of the factorizations. Okay. That's not what we want to do. What we really want to do is do this for the multi-HNTF and actually properly backpropagate these shared matrices. But Okay, so like I said, the only thing, oh, and this text is so small, I'm so sorry. Um, the only thing that's remotely tricky here is the gradient calculation. So let me just say, um, we have, this is the spirit of a theorem. Um, given knowledge of the support of this non-negative constrained least squares problem, which you get while you're going in the forward propagation step, um, computing the gradient of that function with respect to the independent variable A has a closed form expression almost everywhere in the space of real valued matrix pairs. And even better, the gradient expression almost everywhere is just inherited from unconstrained least squares. So pseudo inverse is your friend and you're done. Okay, and then, like I said, um, you have a student who understands uh, the computational graph structure and uh, can implement this then in um, PyTorch for a variety or TensorFlow for a variety of different um, final objective functions f. Okay, and now I get to highlight, right, notice that this um, neural HNCPD, so the neural NCPD um, training method is getting us what maybe looks like a little bit more of a significant improvement over these other models. Um, and uh, 
uh, likely if we were able to combine kind of the good structure of multi-HNTF and the nice training method of neural HNCPD, we'd be really happy. All right, so multi-HNTF is um, what I think is like my favorite hierarchical tensor decomposition model in that it has some nice generalization properties from hierarchical NMF. Um, that model, if you want to do things naively, can just be trained by your favorite NMF method with additional projection step, and you can sometimes get some pretty good results that way. But in particular, um, these neural training methods viewing these problems as um, neural networks and then applying back propagation can help mitigate devastating error propagation through these multi-layer decomposition models. Um, and so future work is to develop this back propagation framework for multi-HNTF and in particular to get all the way back to that first layer NCPD model. Okay, thank you.